Oh, hello, good evening. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from Anu Sabata, Desawe Kanda, also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfred Okanse. Tonight, 39 persons arrested during the Democracy Hub protest against illegal mining have been remanded with others to appear in court tomorrow. How and why? We seek answers. Plus, tell you the exact charges they've been leveled against them and why some lawyers are raising fundamental questions about how things are playing out. Also, civil society continues to mount pressure on government to take decisive steps in dealing with the Galamsey menace. Meanwhile, the media coalition against illegal mining is demanding that the National House of Chiefs clarifies its stance on illegal mining. Stay with us. We've got details and some reactions for you here on Ghana Tonight as we continue the conversation to have you also use your voice. We're here on your election command center. We're in the Ashanti region tonight where we're learning that a magistrate court in Kumasi has nullified some voter transfers in the Menshia South constituency. Our Northern Bureau Chief William Evans Sinkum is bringing us that exclusive detail here on Ghana tonight. Stay with us as to exactly what happened in court today. It's pretty instructive. And we'll get all of that here on your election command center. As always, you're an integral part of the conversation. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana tonight on Facebook and on X. Let's get talking. Well, let's settle for Ghana Briefs. A political science lecture has lashed out at governments for staffing the civil service with grassroots and party foot soldiers. Professor Ransford Jampo has described such situation as undermining the neutrality of the civil service. He called for a collective effort against politicians and government who will seek to politicize the civil service. We do not aspire to achieve the ideals of political neutrality. Every government that gets to power feels that these people, these people, they are MPP people, or these people, they are NDC people. I cannot trust them. So they set up their own civil service. They appoint one person as an advisor to the minister, and that one person, his salary is more than 100 civil servants. The civil society organizations against Galamse have intensified their call on government to declare a state of emergency on the devastating effects of illegal mining. The group in a subtle picket say government's interventions so far have not yielded the desired results, hence the need for what they describe as a comprehensive action. Still standing by our demands that government should declare a state of emergency and also to ban all mining activities, legal and illegal, in our forest reserves and in our rivers, because we think it is irresponsible and not sustainable. Sports Minister Mustafa Yusuf has refuted CAF's claims that Ghana lacks FIFA standard pitches to host Black Stars marches. Following CAF's ban on the Baba Yara Stadium, the only approved venue for international games, Ghana is racing against time to secure a FIFA standard venue for the 2025 AFCON qualifier against Sudan on October 11. Not that we don't have a FIFA standard. We have FIFA standard pitches in Ghana. We have one in Accra, two in Accra, that's here, uh, Accra Sports Stadium and Legon Sports Stadium. We have Baba Yara Sports Stadium, FIFA Standard. We have FIFA Standard Cape Coast. We are renovating a Sipon Sports Stadium. Member of Parliament for Tamale South and owner of Karela United, Honorable Harry Naijuzi, has revealed that the lack of investment in the sports industry has caused the deterioration of Ghana stadiums. However, given the chance, he would sort out long term future plans while also bringing in private investors. This comes after most stadiums in the country got closed down in a bit to refurbish them following CAF's decision to put a ban on them. If you look at Ghana's last uh, match at the Baba Yara Sports Stadium, uh, the technical pundits will tell you that we lost to the pitch. Even passes could not just naturally flow from, flow from one end to the other. Currently, 
even Karela, I cannot use Tamale as my pitch because the Ali Muhammad Stadium is in such a deplorable uh, state. We are using Nalergo and I'm being punished because uh, it's more costly and more expensive for teams to travel uh, down there to Nalergo and uh, many clubs are unhappy about it but we are managing in the time being. The Food and Beverages Association of Ghana strongly opposed the Ghana Revenue Authority's plan to introduce new digital tax stamp machines for their size tax collection, citing financial burdens on manufacturers. According to the association, this follows moves by the authority to introduce new machines to replace those currently used by its members in their facilities for their size tax stamp system. We also want to declare that the machines is a just an individual, so it's going to create a bully, and such a person can do whatever he wants. He can increase the cost tomorrow, he can increase the cost today. And all, not only the machines, but the variables that go with the machines, such as the ink and even the stamp, are all going to be bought by the, the players. And these are all costs. There's more news on 3news.com. Make some time. It's 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, their fight against illegal mining has landed them into remand. That is the story of the arrested protesters of Democracy Hub. We're getting to the details in a bit and as to really why this has become concerning, especially for lawyers who have been following this, who are not necessarily the counsel for these persons. But as we do know today, we're going to put it on the screen shortly, 39 persons who participated in that three-day Democracy Hub demonstration against Galam Singh. And that was why they were on the streets over the last three days, from Saturday uh, through to yesterday, a few of them. They were protesting against the impact of illegal mining that we are seeing all around us. They've been remanded into custody after an Accra circuit court denied their bail application. Now, they were also slapped with multiple charges after the arrest on, on Saturday, September 21. Now, uh, we're going to get into that shortly and the, and the and at least the various charges that they've been slapped with conspiracy to commit crime, namely unlawful assembly, unlawful assembly causing unlawful damage, offense and all those will run through them shortly. But this, this is the, the level of the heavy security presence at the Accra Circuit Court earlier today. Uh, the, the, the court was visibly, um, as it were, washed with police personnel because these persons who were picked up were arraigned before court earlier today with heavy security and police presence there, and they were in, in, in the custody of the Ghana Police Service. You see some of them hugging each other. We understand the lady you see there in black is, is pregnant, we understand, um, and she is also amongst those persons who have been detained, this pregnant lady. And also we got reports that one of the persons who has been detained is also suffering from asthma, an asthmatic patient who's diabetic as well, um, and also with, with um, hepatitis B. Now, there are, there are concerns about the, 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 as to how really um, these persons are, as it were, um, going through this process and how things are playing out, especially with their bail application that has been denied. And there are some lawyers who are raising questions about how things played out earlier today in court. The Ghana Police Service issued a statement earlier today. They detailed from their perspective how things have been going as we speak. Here's just a, uh, highlights of it. 39 of the people who were arrested for engaging in various acts of lawlessness at the 37th intersection in Accra, 22nd, 23rd of September, were put before the court today. As I've indicated to you, the court remanded 28 of them, 28 out of the 39 were remanded into police custody and the re remaining 11 were put into prison custody. So none of them are free as we speak. 30 of the accused persons are to reappear before the court on 8th October 2024, while nine others are to reappear before the court on the 11th of October 2024. So these two groups, that's the 28 in police custody 
11 in prison custody are all going to be in these areas. That's a prison custody and police custody from now till the 8th and the 11th of October. Also, the remaining suspects will be put before the court tomorrow. So this 39 we saw today, they are not the only ones. Remember yesterday, according to the protesters, the leadership of the protesters' legal team, um, about 46 of them, their account had been picked up. And they say there could be more, actually. So the 39 we saw today is just the first group. The police confirms this in their statement that the second group or the rest of the protesters will be put before court tomorrow. And the case is being prosecuted. And take note of this. The last part of the statement that we have from the police service, as we have it, they're going to put on the screen. This case is being prosecuted by the Office of the Attorney General. That's Grace Ansakrofi, Assistant Commissioner of Police, Director of Public Affairs, you have there. And a fundamental question that we're going to be asking um, a private legal practitioner when he joins us shortly as to really um, this last part, whether it raises questions. Because yes, by practice and, and by procedure, the Ghana Police Service prosecutes cases for and on behalf of the Attorney General's office. But when the cases of misdemeanors or light so-called cases like this, you would now want to understand the direct involvement of the Office of the Attorney General in this matter. Well, then again, we'll ask the questions, get some answers to it here on Ghana tonight shortly. Um, but we've been following this quite closely. A number of uh, the, the protesters have also been talking. And in fact, the persons who are associated with them, some of their family members have also been talking to us about what is they are going through and how they are not able to as it were, speak to them and have access to their relatives. The lawyers say they cannot also get access to their clients. They've been denied contact to their client over the last three days that they've been arrested as well. And then also issues related to some matters that have come up so far. So those are the issues that are um, coming up right now. And uh, it's one that we we'll keep an eye on as well. One of the relatives um, that we spoke to earlier also give indication of what they intend to do going forward, especially because of reports of their relative not being too well. They say they received a call from the Ghana Police Service that their relative who has been detained as part of these protesters is not well. Take a look. We scouted through the various police stations and then at around 9 p.m. we found her at Kaneshi. I requested from the counter NCO to speak to my sister. What she could do best was to refer me to the station officer. And then the station officer said they were working under specific um, instructions from the regional command that um, those who were arrested in relation to the protest um, shouldn't be allowed any form of access by anybody, not a family member not even a lawyer. Despite several attempts, including a return to the regional police headquarters the next day. Well, so let's stay a bit further on this. Private legal practitioner Martin Pebo is joining us on Zoom for a quick conversation on this here on Ghana Tonight. Lawyer Martin Pebo, appreciate your time. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. Hello, lawyer. Good evening to you. Yes, good evening, Mr. Kansi. Thank you. Good Thank you. Thank you indeed. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Right. Now, prior to uh, they, that's the protesters appearing before or being arraigned before the court today, their legal counsel had indicated that one, they did not know the police stations that they were being held, two, they had been denied access to their clients, three, they did not know of the charges that were being leveled against them until they went to court today. I mean, is, is this consistent with the practice as you do know it? Not at all. Not at all. This is a case of turning the pride is what would pertain in a banana republic. Not a democratic state such as Ghana. So it tells you that we've gone four steps backwards. I mean, that thing looks like a joke. I can't believe that 
this is what is happening to Kwame Nkrumah's Ghana under Dr. George Ekufudampare. You see, I, I, I just can't believe it because, I mean, if it last year's own, where protesters were uh, arrested, the public uproar, remember a year ago, we were there, we went to join Oliver and doing such a similar demonstration in September, right? <laughs> With the arrest, the public showed a lot of revulsion. And then Ekufu Dampari came out with nine statements, etc. All right? Even the former regional suffered a transfer as a result of that demonstration, right? You see that Dr. Garba Peb is no longer in charge of the Greater Accra Regional Command mm -hmm. because a few persons were arrested, etc. So how come that one year on, one year on, protesters are arrested not allowed to see council, not allowed to have food, contrary to Article 19, Clause 2. 19, Clause 2 is very clear that when you charge a person, you should, one, give that person access to a lawyer and other facilities to enable the person to prepare the defense Right, be able to what prepare that uh, for the trial and so on and so forth. And of course, there is the one that says a person is innocent until proven guilty. So because of that, you are not to use uh, uh, they said uh, custody or they say denial of bail as a form of punishment. Mm -hmm. So the police were required to number one arraign them within forty eight hours. The Supreme Court has made it clear that forty eight hours is forty eight hours, notwithstanding weekends and public holidays uh, and, and, and that's 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 rights. the next question i was getting to because according to some of the 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 lawyers for these protesters some of them were picked up on saturday and they've been in police custody until today tuesday that's well over the 48 hours so could the police have gotten them arraigned before the court on say yesterday monday which was a holiday This at the time, the one who had to implement that's any JSC gave a protocol. He issued a protocol in May 2020 on how to activate the weekend court and public holiday court. I have used it on five different occasions during ACP Abogos trial, during the disturbances in the north, Nalerugu, uh, when some people were arrested from the north and brought down here. Um, Okay, and so on and so forth. So we've done it. And then during some other cases in Circuit Court 1. So I've appeared before Justice Efika Sewa Sarabotri during the Agodio trial on Constitution Day. That was 7 January 2022. Even the Attorney General was present. Of course, we are asking the Attorney General to resign. So I'm not saying it today in a positive light for him because he should have resigned a long time ago. But 7 January 2022, we're in court with him. Constitution, right? Now, before Justice, let's say we appeared, and other people, we appeared before uh, say, Justice uh, Obri, Francis Obri. Then other ones, then uh, Justice, the, the one in the second court. I could name them. So, you remember the first time Oliver was arrested? That mm -hmm. was the same thing. They didn't arraign him within 48 hours. And we kept giving the police education that, no, there is a way to do it. Justice Eni Yeboa had given the protocol. <laughs> Just go and see a registrar. Then the registrar will escalate it to the higher apps. Then they will arrange for a judge. That is the protocol. I Remember, see. this is the decision. I, I took the case to court. And the Supreme Court gave that decision in December 2019. That is Justice Sofia Kufu's validatory judgment. That was the last judgment she gave. Or when she was leaving the bench. Uh, and is that the table number two, correct? Number four. That's a weekend court. Table number see. four versus attorney general number four. The table number two is a non bailable offenses case that every decision is bailable. And in this yes. case, these persons have been denied bail. They are still going to be in police and prison custody until the 8th and 11th of October. That's the development as well today. Yes, so that's very sad, but the saving grace is that under the law, even though it's been adjourned to 8th and 11th, 
the law permits us to go tomorrow, the next day, etc., with cogent reasons to show why the judge should take the bail applications before the 8th and the 11th. And respectfully, I think this is a good case in which the, 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 such an application can be made to abridge the time. You remember this uh, this man's case, uh, Nineku, uh, Nineku, uh, the Beige Capital case. Mm -hmm. He went to court, he was denied bail. Then the next day, or was it the two days after, they went back, uh, this uh, lawyer said, you're sorry, went back to abridge the time. Yes, I'm citing that one because Nineku's case was in the public. But cases that the media don't cover, we do those cases too, where we abridge the time. So nobody's going to wait till if. October and 11th of October. No, in the next few days, uh, lawyers will be going back to the court to abridge the time and to have the bail uh, application remade. Because, hey, citizens' lives are precious, eh? Yes, yes. A citizen's life is more precious than the properties that are alleged to have been destroyed, etc. So we are not to start punishing citizens even when there has not been a trial. No, the police don't need them in custody for two weeks. No, it's not true. You know, sometimes you can't blame the court because it's the police who are seized with the docket. So they usually, they like to just remand people. Uh, they let them keep them in remand. Police don't have a judicial mind. Police are not judicial. They, they are police. They like to lock up citizens. Unfortunately, that's what George Kufudampari is doing. And it's unfortunate. Look, it's what I can say. That's what I'm saying. IGP has to go. Here, Madam Ando Kofi. When we reported the chairman who to me case, the Akunta mining case, why mm -hmm. didn't they prosecute that case? If they had prosecuted that case, because of who chairman who to me is, can you imagine the chilling effect it would have had on other Galamseyers if they saw every day Mr. Kansi reported today in court, chairman who to me's case, this is what has happened in court, blah, blah, blah. Can you imagine how it was? It would have well, well, so you want the IGP sacked because of, you want the IGP sacked because of this? Yes, because he failed to prosecute the chairman who to me case, and also because he has ab ab abused the rights of these citizens. Uh, the, this uh, demonstration is too much. IG is being too political. He's being too political. Who is he defending? President Kufuado. Kufuado is down. Kufuado has failed. Ghanaians have given the verdict. So why is IG continuing being uh, so, so, so political, being more Catholic than even the Pope? Why? Ebu Fado is down. The verdict is out. This is well, the worst president we've had. Who said he would put his line and his presidency on the line? He ended up just being a sloganier, right? Just sloganeering. So why is IG Dan Perry defending? Why is uh, Madame Andokofi defending him? Why? Council, so, and, and finally, and this is a quick one before I let you go. Uh, we're seeing this case as well by by procedure the police prosecutes cases for and on behalf of the attorney general's office that's normal procedure but in this case based on the police's own statement which we'll put portions of, of it on the screen shortly they say on the last point that this case is being prosecuted by the attorney general's office does anything strike you there as as reason to to raise questions really Absolutely. Absolutely. The first thing is that usually uh, quite a number of the offenses, okay, that are, are on the charge sheet from what we've heard, unlawful assembly, for instance, it's a misdemeanor. When we say misdemeanor, it's usually the, one of the lowest crimes. So usually people are not sent to jail for misdemeanors. They are fined if they are found guilty, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the attorney general usually doesn't prosecute these cases unless there is politics in it, unless there is politics in it. So you see why I said that. Political, being more Catholic. I was destroyed. An unlawful assembly. It's a misdemeanor. It's a distraction of property that we need to see the charge to see what kind of property because that one it has two levels. There's a misdemeanor and then there can be the second degree felony. But once I've not seen the I stick out my neck to say uh, second degree felony. The difference is that when the value of the property is less than one million, then it's a misdemeanor. 
but when it is above one million cities, then it's a second degree felony. So once right. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, uh, Lawyer Martin Quibble, a point well made indeed. And uh, I think that you made quite clearly um, the details of the, the position of the law on this matter and some of the issues and how things are playing out now, which raises fundamental questions about uh, the procedure as has been employed now. But I thank you. Thank you for your time here on Ghana tonight. I, I really do ap apologize for the cranky nature of the connection to Lawyer Martin Quibble today but he's a private legal practitioner joining us here on Ghana tonight coming up next there's a development in Kumasi in the Ashanti region regarding some voters transfer where a magistrate court has been making orders we touch base with a man on the ground William Evans Inkum, and and to get details of this because this is interesting and it's coming at a time like this we're talking about issues related to errors in transfers and what the NDC has been talking about this is your election command center and this is your election command center a magistrate court in Kumasi in the Ashanti region has nullified a transfer of voters in the Mensha South constituency, the court on Tuesday, September 24, that's uh, today, ordered the Electoral Commission of Ghana to revert the voters in question back to where they were transferred from. That's what happened. William Evans Sinkum is our Northern Bureau Chief. He's joining us on the telephone for a quick one on this. William, I appreciate your time here on Ghana tonight. Let's get a bit more de details into this. What, first off, is the foundation of this case that has led to the court's ruling that these voters were wrongly transferred and so the EC should reverse their transfers of their votes? Well, so uh, on September 20, the parliamentary candidate of the ruling New Patriotic Party, Nani J. Bapewa, uh, and some executives of the party, uh, petitioned the court that some uh, about 1,000 uh, voters who transferred their vote to the Mensha South constituency did that illegally. And in fact, he cited it in one CI-91 as the foundation for uh, his petition as far as um, his argument that those voters do not qualify to vote in that particular or the Mensha South constituency is concerned. In, 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 don't forget, the Mensha South constituency is the constituency of the, uh, the vice presidential candidate of the ruling New Patriotic Party, um, Dr. Matthew Pukupenpe, who was once upon a time the lawmaker for that particular constituency. Uh, so on, after the hearing, or after petitioning the court, um, the court invited landlords of those uh, about 1,000 uh, a voters alleged to not having the legal right to vote in that particular constituency or the Manchester country to come there or to come to the court and then testify. So some came and some could not make it. So today we, we, we understand that the court made a ruling, that the Kumasi Magistrate Court made a ruling that about 600 uh, uh, voters out of the 1,000 do not qualify, or they are, I mean, voters, voters transfer uh, have been nullified by the court. But as I speak to you now, both the Electoral Commission, when I make call to the Electoral Commission, they are saying that they do not have the full fact of this particular ruling. And for that matter, they are still waiting on the court to provide them full details so they can also do some reconciliation. Later by tomorrow, they are likely to come out. Uh, with their position as far as the court today's court ruling is concerned. Of course, for the NDC, it's kind of indifferent. I spoke to the regional uh, organizer of the party. They are saying that so far, those people who were, whose names were, uh, were, were allowed to remain in the voters' role as far as Manchester's constituency is concerned, um, they, had, they still have their numbers there, they still have their people there, and so they also do not know the about 600 people that the ND, NPP claimed that uh, they were brought into the Manchester staff constituency illegally. For the NPP, they think that it is a win for them, but it looks like 
we are going to clear a specific number as to how many voters um, who transferred their vote to the Manchester constituency were affected uh, by the latest court ruling and what they are going to do. I'm talking about the voters, what they are going to do as far as uh, this particular ruling is concerned. So okay. essentially, this is, is, is uh, the N NPP issue, correct? That is a case of NPP members within that constituency taking this action co to court and the court indeed looking into their case and and making that ruling that their votes were transferred wrongly and so that action should be reversed well absolutely so th that is the NPP taking the matter to court that uh, the suspect that about 1,000 voters who transferred their vote from various uh, constituencies to the Manchester South constituency did so illegally, and 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 for that matter, who, um, they are seeking a revenge of that particular action, which the court, the magistrate court, the magistrate court today granted. William, appreciate you for this, and William Evans Singham is our Northern Bureau chief. Then this is an issue that also clearly raises fundamental questions about what has to be done as well going forward, especially with this court ruling and the concerns that the NDC has raised about these wrongful transfer of votes or illegal transfer of votes, which the court now has ruled. And this is the case of the MPP, and this is the Mesha South constituency. That's the constituency of the vice presidential candidate of the MPP, Dr. Matthew Poco Prempe. There, we'll see how things play out in the coming days on this matter here on your election command center. But coming up next is an issue that is taking not just the environmental angle or the social angle, but the political angle as well. Because where exactly does the National House of Chiefs stand in the matter of illegal mining? The media coalition against illegal mining has been demanding answers, specifically from the president of the National House of Chiefs. And this was on the back of a statement that the president of the National House of Chiefs uh, made, that's uh, Ojehoho Yaojebi II, sometime last week, about the impact of the ban or the proposed ban on illegal mining when it comes to the economy and so on. Let's take a listen to exactly what the president of the National House of Chiefs said, reason why this coalition is asking for clarity. You all know I hate Galamse. I fight against it. It, however, does not mean that you shouldn't mine. We own the gold. There are good ways of mining. If you make an application, you'll be taught how to correctly mine. Those calling for state of emergency, a ban on mining, are not considering its impact. It will have dire consequences. People can lose their jobs. Do you know how much money we'll lose? So that's the president of the National House of Chiefs there talking about this proposal not being thought through because of the impact. Well, the coalition, the Ghana coalition against Galamse, they issued a statement earlier today. They're asking a number of questions. With, the, with a sense of pressing urgency, they've noted with utter disappointment the position of the National House of Chiefs conveyed through its president. Now, the question is whether the president spoke in his personal capacity or in his capacity representing the opinion of all the members of the House of Chiefs. That's another question altogether. They're purporting to reject any ban on, on all forms of mining. The coalition further notes the House of Chiefs' notable silence and its belated position now published and should this statement be correctly understood the way it is relayed the coalition notes that the national House of chiefs has regrettably reinforced and incentivized the rampant and wanton destruction of ghana's environment and the commonwealth bequeathed to us by our forebears so that's uh, there but engineer dr ken ashikbe is one of the leaders in fact the convener for this coalition against Galamse issued a statement. He's joining us on Zoom. Appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us, Engineer Dr. Ken Ashikbe. So, really, uh, we played that statement from the President of the National House of Chiefs. Clear in his words there. You're asking questions. Exactly what clarity are you talking about now? So, if you... 
the house on the 6th of February this year. They had, the economy had some six points, uh, which included um, establishment of special courts to prosecute offenders of illegal mining and logging expeditiously. And then they also included being placed, uh, you know, uh, being put on boards, uh, members being put on boards of these regulatory institutions. But then when, the, um, since we've got this uh, surge in turbidity, with turbidity getting as high as um, 14,000 to use in the sector, in my water works, we have not had the Council of uh, the National House of Chiefs issue any statements specifically, only to hear that the president of the Council of Chiefs talk about his credentials in terms of fighting Galamsey, but then talk about the fact that he was uh, against, uh, you know, the ban on uh, illegal mining. You know, uh, I'm not too sure you know, the way he puts it, uh, you know, and he's against this um, state of emergency on all the calls that over 50 uh, bodies are calling for, but does not really offer any alternatives about how to deal with the challenges that we are confronted with and wanting to make the argument for the monies that uh, we make out of uh, mineral exploration. And we believe that for somebody that holds the particular play uh, seat that he holds as a revered chief and as a president of the House of uh, Chiefs, it is important that when we are within a crisis, they are very clear in uh, the, the points that they make, especially when you have, uh, as I said, stability getting as high as 14,000, you have people people dying in the pit, you have your water being polluted with heavy metals, you have several chamfans sitting on our water bodies. What exactly is it is the position of the National House of Chiefs? Especially when we know that the water bodies on uh, the water bodies on the water bodies and the buffers of the water bodies are illegal to mine. So there's no call of a ban on that. That one is just declaration of the state of emergency and taking the actions to enforce that particular law. The only place that the ban is being asked for, whether you know legal or illegal, is in the forest reserves for which right. uh, you know we uh, most of these river bodies take right. their sources. Right, right. But but the, the the president of the National House of Chiefs Engineer was quite clear in his in his thought and his position that this call for a ban on small scale mining and, if, and in fact illegal mining and all forms of mining has not been thought through well by you because of the consequence and the impact on it. Uh, that's on the economy and, and other matters as well. So you should consider that. And, but then again, uh, well, you, you raise questions about and unfortunately we lost engineer Dr. Ken Ashikbe there. Uh, we'll try to raise him back on the telephone uh, that's also on, on Zoom to have a conversation on this. But on the back of this, I want to tell you that tomorrow here on TV3 and on 3FM 92.7, we are joining forces with all like-minded groups and individuals to speak against the impact of illegal mining. It's not going to be a period of no action talk only. So we're asking the Galam Safe Fight beyond the talk, what next? It's tomorrow at 10 a.m. here at TV3, the Executive Theater, Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklo, Brigadier General Nuno Mensah, retired former National Security Advisor, Awala Sewa, a coordinator, co conscious citizens, Dr. Richard Selome, General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. We have Mustafa Seidu, who's a director, Nature and Development Foundation. They are partnering us here at, at Media General to do this. And then also Daryl Bosu, uh, Deputy National Coordinator of Arocha Ghana, and Andy Apiakubi is MP for Asante Achim North constituency. He makes the claim that in his constituency there is no Galamse taking place. We want to have him tell us what has contributed to this success story that he has. We're bringing all these persons together to talk about all the aspects of this Galamse conversation. 
from the health aspect, from the environment aspect, and also how it is impacting on our water. The Director General of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR, would also be joining us here um, tomorrow morning on TV3 and on 3FM 92.7. So make a date, can join us. Let's have this all-important conversation here on Media General. Now, coming up next, we cross over live to New York in the United States of America where the United Nations General Assembly is ongoing for some live updates here on your election command center. Our international correspondent, Sunny Abdul Rahman is going to be joining me shortly to, to have a conversation on how things have been playing out, especially with conversations that are of interest to us as a country. And the president, Nana Danko Ekofado, this is his last General Assembly, is going to be attending, or he is attending, and also been making some comments. We understand tomorrow he is expected to deliver an address at the General Assembly. We'll get all of that detail. But earlier today, the President of the United States, Joe Biden, had a word for Ghana and other countries going to the polls this year and the need to uphold all the tenets of democracy. Take a look. It's been the honor of my life. There's so much more I want to get done. As much as I love the job, I love my country more. I decided after 50 years of public service, it's time for a new generation of leadership to take my nation forward. We've seen citizens across the world peacefully choosing their future, from Ghana to India to South Korea, nations representing one quarter of humanity who will hold elections this year alone. My fellow leaders, let us never forget, some things are more important than staying in power. Well, it says some things are more important than staying in power. So are the last words of Joe Biden to leaders of countries going to the elections, like Ghana, obviously, um, some 73 days to election day, December 7, many your election command center. Let's cross over to New York live right now to my colleague, Sunny Abdul Rahman who is connecting with us. And Abdul Sani, can you hear me? Good evening from Ghana. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening, Alfred. Now, if you could, if you could flip it around, and, and I want to see you um, uh, as we speak. So um, you tell us exactly what, what's been going on. Um, if you could flip the camera around so we see you right now, we get to see what's going on as well, um, what has been happening over the period. And indeed, well... Uh, thank you for, for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Run us through how the day has been at the UN General Assembly today. Uh, Alfred, if the camera lens is okay, a lot has been happening here uh, at the UN headquarters. As you indicated, the highlight of the day has been the address by the US President Joe Biden, who used the occasion to highlights the achievement of his administration on the global stage. Uh, let's not forget when he took over, he made a pledge to uh, restore America's leadership on the global stage, which according to his party, the previous administration had tainted the image of the United States on the world stage. So he talked briefly on that, also talked about uh, efforts by his administration to unite the world. We are seeing growing division, Alfred, on all fronts in the area of economy. We are seeing a lot of trade wars in the area of security. We are seeing multiple conflicts in Africa, in Europe, in the Middle East. Also, in the area of uh, technology, we are seeing uh, cyber attacks growing. We are seeing the threats posed by artificial intelligence. All these uh, issues were raised by Joe Biden in his uh, farewell address as the U.S. President of the United Nations today, Alfred. I see. Now, uh, and it obviously mentioned Ghana in there, and talk about Ghana. President Anadranko Ekofuado is there, and you tell me that he's expected to address the gathering tomorrow? Uh, yes, uh, Alfred. Even before that, I think uh, Joe Biden made good use of uh, 
this ordeal, what happened to him sometime in, in June when uh, members of his own party raised concern about his uh, fitness to run for office. Uh, he has used this story to tell world leaders who, who will also be going for elections uh, maybe this month, next month, like Ghana is going on December 7 and the rest of the countries. Uh, some countries are have not even fixed the election days yet because of uh, issues that they have internally. So these are all uh, issues that could uh, lead to chaos in their respective countries. Of course, it has rippling and spreading effects, as we have seen uh, in a whole lot of places around the world. So Joe Biden is telling his story and uh, telling world leaders that if left to him alone, he would have stayed in office. But Clearly, his party wanted somebody else, and he had to give way. So he's also telling them, when you lose power, peacefully hand over so that the country will not be destabilized. In terms of President Akufuado, yes, uh, he's poised to uh, deliver his statement tomorrow. We are already aware of some Ghanaians who would be protesting around the New York headquarters, uh, who will be protesting against what they have described as uh, his bad leadership, according to them. Uh, so we'll be engaging them tomorrow to understand what they have. But the president essentially will be telling the world what they need to do to help Africa accelerate its development. The president has been very vocal when it comes to the imbalances in how the global governance system uh, is being operated and how it is impacting negatively the socioeconomic development of Africa. So he's expected to go all out, especially this is his last address. He has... Uh, basically nothing to lose. So he will be going all out on that front. He has also been talking about the financial reparation for slavery that happened centuries ago. Uh, we have seen some Western nations admitting uh, the cruelty and the injustice meted right. out to our forefathers, and they are willing to have a negotiation. But President Akubado wants the entire process accelerated. Abdul Sani Rahman, thank you very much for this update. And tomorrow uh, at 2 p.m. Ghana time, you'll see the president will be addressing the gathering there. We'll connect with you as always. Thank you so much for giving us this brief. Appreciate you. Sani Abdul Rahman is an international correspondent, my colleague here at Media General, covering the United Nations General Assembly here on your election command center and across all media general platforms and there's more on three news.com right after this quick break we're getting to manifesto check stay with us on manifesto check tonight something about the political parties positioning on the anti-lbtq conversation and matters arising dennis yes rightly so so you recall that this conversation has been a very topical one at least in the last two years and uh, many had thought that when they got to the parties crafting their manifestos, it would be one of the things that would find their way into their manifestos, just so that they can solidify the public comments that they've been making. You do recall that it got to a point where every leader of, a, of the political parties was required to make a public statement as to whether they were for or against anti-LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. Then we go to a point where some members of parliament, predominantly from the minority, sponsored a private member's bill to have a law that would prescribe all activities of um, LGBTQ in, in, in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So flowing from that, the expectation was that if those public commitments were made before the crafting of the manifestos, then those views or those positions should manifest in their manifestos. Um, we've been looking at the manifesto to see if they've come in any shape or form. But let's take you back to January 2024, where former president and now flag bearer for the National Democratic Congress John Dramani Mahama made a public um, statement regarding his stance on the matters of LGBT. And this was what he said. I am against LGBTQ. I am a member of the Assemblies of God Church and my faith is against it. The faith I have does not allow a man to marry a man and a woman to marry a woman. Mm. He continues by saying that the anti-LGBTQ currently before parliament, mm -hmm. the government has indicated that President Ekufuadu will not sign it into law when passed. And this was uh, John Mahama speaking about what would become of the anti-LGBTQ bill if it was passed by Parliament. This was in January 2020. I see. You and I know what has become of it. It's now become a subject of litigation True. before the Supreme Court. Mm. Now, when you look at the 
flag bearer of the new patriotic party and vice president at that he also made a public statement regarding his position on this and this was in april 2024 mm -hmm. few months after john mahama had made his stance clear he also says that as a muslim my view on this matter aligns with the position of my religious faith the holy quran is replete with verses frowning on lgbt lgbtq acts including same-sex marriages my faith is therefore very strictly against the practice of homosexuality no ifs or buts no shades of gray so he had also made this public declaration on his position on this it does reflect his personal view but mm. the sentiment out there was that what really are the positions of the parties themselves when it comes to this and will this manifest in their well, they all make reference to their religious affiliation yes right? so when you look at the mpp manifesto for instance they have just a small part of it that says that they are making a promise to protect the Ghanaian cultural and family values right as to what this exactly means it's quite unclear but when the vice president was confronted with the question as to whether or not he would sign the anti-lgbtq bill to law this was the response that he gave the bill is before uh, the supreme court right now um and i think once the supreme court brings it i think there are certain challenges that have been made to it uh, that it, uh, to say that it is not consistent with the constitution or whatever but of course we will wait for it to come uh and 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 once it's it's out of the supreme court and and they declare it as as constitutional uh i believe that the signing is automatic uh, there shouldn't be any issue no ifs and no buts <laughs> bamu yada uh, bamu yada Yes, no ifs, no buts. Bam. But of course, this is what is captured in the manifesto. You are unable to find anything of this sort in the NDC manifesto. But you know, and, the, the, the basis for that question, and this is in 30 seconds, if, before he becomes president or yes. the outcome of this election, mm -hmm. this, this bill, if not passed into law, mm -hmm. will die with the life of this parliament mm -hmm. and the entire process will start all over again in the next parliament, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whoever becomes president, 2025 mm -hmm. would have to deal with a new process of a new bill and that is even the more reason why there had to be a commitment of some sort that would be made in the manifestos of the respective parties mm. just so we know where they are stand but Absolutely. at least this is here to protect guardian cultural and family values the ndc does not have anything of this sort but at least i mean they've made their position also clear through their flag bearer. But that's it for Manifesto Check. The verdict, as we always say, is with the people. It is indeed with the people. Dennis Poberry with them. This morning is on 3news.com. My name is Alfred Akansi. Join us same time tomorrow, 10 p.m. We're going to tonight make a date tomorrow at 10 a.m. for our conversation on the fight against illegal mining here at TV3 Executive Theatre. Have a good night.